listening to the Movie Scramble podcast. Apologies for that weird laugh halfway through the introduction there. I just got distracted by Simi, so you're getting the blame for this. On today's episode, we are talking about Saint Maud, the British indie film that is hitting cinemas while they're still open this week. It is written and directed by Rose Glass and stars Morvid Clark and Jennifer L. It takes nothing special to mop up after the dying. You're prettier than the last one. But to save a soul, that's quite something. Bless Amanda's body and bless her mind, which is shrouded in darkness. When you pray, do you get a response? Oh, it's like he's physically in me. It's how he guides me. My little saviour. It's a kind of low-budget indie horror with lots of nods to other films within the genre. And the film basically focuses around the relationship between Maud and her patient Amanda. Maud is a carer, a private carer, and she is sent to look after Amanda, who is a former dancer and choreographer who is basically terminally ill. It has lots of horror elements, it has lots of uh, mental health elements, and it has lots of religious fanaticism elements. It's definitely one that is a slow burn. It's quite still, it's quite tense, and for me, I definitely think it's a movie that's going to get under your skin. St Maud, interestingly, was the patron saint of carers until she became the patron saint of misbehaving children. And there's lots of other little religious allusions throughout the film that if you went to a Catholic school like I did, you probably picked them up straight away. And if you're a dirty heathen, you probably didn't. (laughs) Um, So on that note, John, what did you think of the film? So what do you think? I am Catholic or dirty heathen? With that hair, I'm going to assume you're Catholic. I'm not going to lie. We do get good good heads of hair. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, can't can't go in the sun for (laughs) This was a very unsettling film for me, probably because of the fact that I recognise some of the the religious aspects of it and the fanaticism that you always get within a, a Catholic community of one form or another with people who are totally taken over by the church and basically their life revolves around it now. In the case of Maud, it's a very recent conversion, and it's, well, it's it's never gone into any explicit detail, but something happened to her before she started going into the palliative care arena of nursing, and it's touched upon a couple of times, and I think there's a glimpse or two of it at the start, the very start of the film, and then later on as well, a couple of very, very short sequences. It doesn't really explain an awful lot about what went on, and you really have to work at trying to figure out why she is what she is and what her motivations are. So in that way, there's, there's a whole sort of mystery element to it as well, which you just layer that on top of the, the horror and the psychological aspects and the mental health aspects as well. And it makes it this sort of multi-layer film that just keeps you going, even though it is slow and there is not a, an, an awful lot in the way of any sort of, I, I don't want to say action because it's not that type of film, but, mm-hmm. you know, it's a thriller without having like a lot of thrills in it, for instance. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a wee bit weird that way, but I was totally on board for it right from the very start when you see the titles going from white to red and you think, OK, we're in for something here. That's that's a very deliberate choice. No, I thought it was very, very atmospheric. And as you said, it's, there's no jump scare. So if you're going into this movie expecting a kind of horror, like maybe The Exorcist or Carrie type of sense where you're going to get those kind of thrills and spills, this definitely isn't that type of movie. In actual fact... When you look at the characterisation of Maud as somebody who's quite plain and quite pious, the film's quite like that as well. There's nothing kind of, it's all very simple and very neat, but I liked it for that reason. Simi, you kind of alluded to it earlier, of course, The Guardian gave it five stars. Are you going to tell me you didn't like it or...? No, 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 it's not I didn't like it. Um, I, I've, got, I've got mixed feelings in the film. I thought maybe the first 40 to 45 minutes, and I'm, I, I'm quite on board with the slow burn idea. Yep. I just thought it was dull. Uh, wasn't really doing much for me. I get her building the atmosphere and that. But I got to a point, I'm like, right, I really need to do something soon because it's not keeping my interest. There's not enough happening. And I don't mean, when I say happening, I don't mean from an action point of view. I mean, there's not enough on screen that's keeping my interest. It did towards the second half. I maybe said the last half hour in the movie. And I thought it was really well done. Frightening than it was supposed to be. I absolutely love the last scene, particularly the last shot. 
yeah. it was disturbing and it's really stayed with me. I would say there's no jump scares in the film. There's certainly one. Uh, I don't want to see anything because a spoiler. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, but, so, so I think one in the span of a whole movie is probably yeah. not, like, I wouldn't, it's just not a, what I no meant was it's not a movie that relies on them. No, there's no, yeah. there's no fake out jump scares type idea. Um, but I thought one of the most, but at that point the most frightening part of the film was a jump scare. I thought it was quite funny as well because a lot of horror films get criticised for that even when done well. Yeah. And this will probably get praise for doing it because they don't do it a lot but it still it still does incorporate very common horror tropes at times yeah it just does it in a different style uh the use of this use of, use of sound really kind of adds to it and really kind of get this really makes it unsettling as well uh, yeah absolutely there's a couple of moments that i can think of which are featured in the trailer so i'm not giving away anything one where she spills the seeds to kneel on to make yeah. praying more uncomfortable and when she puts her foot in the shoe that's got the tacks that are facing up the way as well that really and that type of sound but it, it does really sound like what's happening really made me feel a wee bit kind of like nauseous and stuff like that and i quite like that element of it as well it was it was physically uncomfortable to watch a couple of the a couple of the scenes as well and i really enjoyed that element of it as well i'm not going to lie i didn't actually look at the last 20 minutes because i'm a big shite bag and obviously the last like split second of the film i wasn't anticipating and that image has not left my thoughts since monday night but i i love that whole kind of really getting under your skin making you uncomfortable and because your brain tells you that something bad's going to happen and you're anticipating the jump scare and it doesn't quite get there it takes you somewhere else i'm like that I like that unsettling type of horror. A friend of mine went to see it as well, and I don't. I need to be careful if I say this because I don't want to give away any spoilers. But he felt the film was very ambiguous, and I think the last shot kind of pisses in that idea. Yeah, a hundred percent. Hundred percent. Well, it wasn't just me then. He kind of. He. I think he's kind of looking at it as the last shot could be subjective. I'm like, no, I think the last shot was very like hammer, nail, head, bang. Yeah, because up until that point, I did wonder: is this a I don't know, like a, a psychotic episode or is this a mental health issue or something? Is all of this happening exactly as we see it or is this us being shown what's happening from Maud's perspective? So it is quite ambiguous up until that point yeah. and then I would say the last scene, as you say, pisses all over that and goes, oh no, this is definitely happening. <laughs> yeah, because you're, so, you're always with the character. Yes. Yeah. It's always from Maud's point of view. I would disagree with you a, a wee bit about the, the jump scare. It's in that uh, it wasn't anticipated at any time because it's not that it wasn't set out as that type of film and you're kind of preconditioned to jump scares now with the mm -hmm. way that they're set up there's a certain amount of music and sound effects and sort of background elements that come into play with any jump scare and especially if you've got a jump scare it doesn't turn out to be one there was mm -hmm. nothing like that i mean like you say, there was just this whole sort of psychological build up and it was just keep going yet like you say mary your brain is saying there's something not right here, there's something going to happen here. But when it actually does happen, it came as a real surprise to me. And it came as a real surprise to the, the woman who was sitting three rows behind me <laughs> and screamed. I don't Sorry, know if you John. heard that. I don't know if you heard that, Thomas, but somebody actually, it, that pro that gave me a second jump after the first one <laughs> when I heard this scream. <laughs> oh, no. What was worse was instead of screaming, I just, I literally couldn't stop myself. I just went, oh, no, like this, really loud. And I was like, oh, God. And then literally just had my eyes on the floor until I was convinced that scene was finished because I fucking hate stuff like that and because we were I felt like we were getting to the end of the film and there had been no jump scares it also lulled me conversely into a false sense of security that there wasn't going to be any so yeah I really really shit myself with that <laughs> and that's the thing with a lot of horror films and I think it's like you're right John a lot of kind of jump scares will kind of there's a setup to prepare yeah. you for that to leave you yeah. on it and kind of push over the edge but they're a lot of the time they're usually the fake jump scares mm-hmm Mm -hmm. uh, to almost kind of like trick you and then it's the ones that are, are scary that you don't see coming because they just kind of come out of nowhere and I didn't even then them. even then with a film that gives you fake jump scares then you know there are going to be real ones yeah because that's the way that they work they, they work in that basis that uh, they'll fool you and fool you and fool you again only to get that reaction and the hope that the reaction's so much more powerful with a with a real jump scare. So, but you didn't get any of that with this film. It was just very tense, and the the lead up to that, and it, it was kind of the turning point of the film. 
for me because it was roughly about halfway through and that's really when shit started to get real or as far as Maud was concerned shit really started to get real for her because she kind of spiralled from that moment in time. She was fairly contained with what she was doing. She yeah. she was doing her job and she was doing it well. She was obviously, she was having troubles. She was having problems keeping herself together, but it seemed to be, that seemed to be kind of the turning point for her. That whole sequence where she was out for the night and all this sort of stuff and yeah. giving the guy the hand job. Yeah. <laughs> So last I, time I'm going out with you, Tom. I was <laughs> going to say, what bloody nights out do you go on? <laughs> glad the pubs are shut or something. <laughs> yeah, no, I thought it was it was interesting. It was uh, it was a film that was sort of tightly controlled within itself. And again, that's kind of realising the characterisation of Maud. She was sort of slowly losing control. And as, as that kind of progressed, the film sort of let you in a little bit more each time. What I loved about it for me personally was it's a film that's very dependent on relationships. So there's not a massive cast. So it's, you know, Maud's relationship with her past, Maud's relationship with Amanda, and actually Maud's relationship with her religion, which is a very, very new thing, but it's very, very intense. Almost like a new relationship with a boyfriend, where it's, you know, you're in the honeymoon phase when it all first starts and it's all very intense and you're together all the time. And I, I love that sort of balance between there were just every so often there was just little hints of information about different elements of these relationships in our life, all the while you're not really getting to know Maud personally, despite the fact that she's the person we're with all the time. And, and obviously you've got the contrast between, you know, Amanda, this sort of hedonistic, you know, choreographer who's all about, you know, using her body for a living, whereas Maud dresses like she's 4,000 years old, despite the fact that she's clearly a young girl. What did you think of the dynamic between these two characters? I found it was quite interesting and uh, it made sense in terms of uh, the, the plot as well. Just from the idea that it's not a lot, this film's not on for long either, and it has to mm-hmm. settle, it has, it has to build the relationship uh, quite quickly. And it, to really kind of hammer home Maud's piousness, what better way to do it than put in a situation where she feels she can save the heathen? Yeah, do you think that was too shoehorned in? Did that take away from your enjoyment? Or no, I, I didn't think it was shoehorned in. No, no, I didn't think it was just to me, it was just part of the plot. That's how the film kind of started. The idea that she happened to be very religious and she was looking after somebody that wasn't. Mm-hmm. I didn't look at it as a matter of convenience, I just looked at it as a matter of it didn't seem that big a yeah. coincidence, really, for me. It's just that it's a plot in the movie, it's it helps to set up, it worked in the context of it. It was a kind of case, like if you had to see like a, tw- a 10 15 minute setup of more talking about how religious she is and all that, and then she gets mm-hmm. assigned this new Kerry, so to speak, and it happens to be a man, then she happens to be like this, then it would feel mm-hmm. sure on then, but this just felt quite natural. No, I just, I thought the character of Amanda was particularly good because she basically didn't have a care. She mm-hmm. she didn't care how she appeared to the likes of Maud. Now, under circumstances where she wasn't dying, it may have been slightly different. She might have been a little more reserved, but then she wouldn't have come, in con- come into contact with somebody like Maud in that case but obviously she is at the end of her life and she just she she wants to still enjoy herself as much as possible now and if that's at the expense of somebody else such as a nurse then she'll do that she's quite a cruel person the way that she treats Maud only reinforces Maud's belief that she can somehow save her it doesn't matter how she's treated in any way she, she's she's on a course and she's not going to be deviated from that and it's 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 quite sad obviously looking at it from both sides because neither of them are going to change in any way mm-hmm. she's not going to become any less devout based on what amanda tells her and amanda's certainly not going to change what she does and how she does it based on Maud trying to clamp down on her drinking like she pours away all her, her booze mm-hmm. at one point and tries to limit the, the guests that come to see her and everything but it doesn't make a blind bit of difference to either of them it's almost like a predestined course for both of them yeah and amanda obviously despite the fact that she's dying is still quite a quite a sexualized character like she has her her girlfriend round who presumably is getting paid to have sex with her I don't know if you can... So yeah, I don't know if the appropriate word. And she watches a lot of her own choreography that is quite sexual and obviously using her body. And what I thought was interesting as well is, again, to go back to this kind of idea of Maud having this sort of intense relationship with God, there's a clear insinuation here that when she's praying, she's like orgasming. There's a sort of sexual element of her religiousness. And I thought that was a little bit odd. It's not something I've ever come across before. And I thought it was quite an interesting thing because it was almost like, 
not bringing her down to Amanda's level, but it was almost like your obsessions just the same as mine. We're both seeking pleasure or we're both seeking satisfaction out of the relationships that we're having. So that might be a bit twee and a wee bit on the nose, but that's kind of what I, what I took from that, those kind of scenes. I suppose, I don't know, I think about it until you mentioned it there. And then when you find out more about Amanda's character and what she was like, to what she's trying to be born again. She's kind of getting a kick where she can, basically. In a yeah. way, maybe. She kind of substituting one thing for another. And, yeah. And I, I think it's... You get the character of Amanda, who I thought was real interesting. And I'd like to have seen Moria in the film at the time. But I suppose, in retrospect, she was in it. She's she done her job. Um, she's a fading star, as you say. She's watching her own choreography and that. She knows she's dying. She knows the best parts of her life are over. But she's clinging on to that heading this lifestyle as best she can. And you've got Maud basically saying, well, you can be born again, just like I was. And she's like, nah. <laughs> nah I like fucking and drinking, so no thank you. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? Yeah, no, I thought it was a really beautifully shot movie, actually. There's there's a scene where she, Maud is sort of running down a kind of alleyway, but it's turned so it's like a horizontal shot as opposed to vertical. And there's a lot of really beautiful imagery in it. And it's, actually some of the shots at nighttime in particular were kind of exorcist S, I thought. And there's a lot of kind of, I think, slight nods to other kind of horror movies. What did you guys think of it visually? It was very muted colours all through yeah. it because it kind of emphasised the fact that this is what both of these characters are reduced to. They're, they're working in this sort of faded seaside town where yeah. even when Maud is going along the, the seafront and it's all flashing lights and everything, it looks seedy and it looks tacky and it just looks mm-hmm. a bit dirty and there's not there's nothing glamorous about it. I think there was a reason why they, they did a lot, of, a lot of the shots at night as well because you can't there's no, there's no redeeming factors in it. When she's walking along and she's going into these pubs and stuff like that, it's all nighttime because you don't want to see anything that could actually sort of change your idea of the the seafront and the sort of area as well. And even when it was like during the day, they made sure that, I don't know if this is just British weather, but when they were filming the, the seafront, when she bumped into another nurse and other people, it was grim, it was grey, there was, there, was no, there was no light she didn't see that there was no light at all, even towards the very end of the film when she was starting to have some visions. Now, I'm not going into any spoilers here. That was all greyness and everything as well. There was nothing to change the mood of the film whatsoever. It set out as still quite early in those sort of terms yeah. and it didn't change it. And if you think about the way that the shots were actually set up, like in Amanda's house, it's this big sprawling townhouse that she's in and it was very dark and gloomy and it was all these sort of heavy dark woods every, everywhere so you got this sort of very constrictive atmosphere about the, the whole piece without anybody really having to say oh it's a bit gloomy in here you know when you open a curtain there was nothing <laughs> like that it was just it added to the whole sort of atmosphere of the film i thought yeah definitely some of your thoughts sorry <clears throat> Oh yeah, it's a good chance, just but I can't, I can't add anything more to that. Basically, it really, it really kind of gave you that. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the Don't drain. know what the Guardian review. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, the draining of the colours really added. I mean, the, the scene that really kind of made me unsettled, which wasn't even like, one of the more kind of scarier scenes, when she's sitting in the cafe. And it just looks like the most depressing place in the world. And she's looking about and there's people with her paper and mm. it's not happy. It just looks like a miserable place to be. And even the pub she goes to later on just it looks like a sofa hall. But that's mm. probably oh, and that's she's giving the guy the hand job, like literally just like yeah. People can fucking see. She's just standing at this wee like opening bit that looks like maybe a, a corridor that would lead to a toilet or something, and she's just standing in that corridor. So it's literally just off the bar. Like everything about it is grim. It looks like the type of place where if you put your elbow on the table by mistake, it would stick. Like it was really just like bogging looking. I don't know if it ever names like I. I know they filmed in Scarborough, but does it ever name where it is, or is it just this kind of like just sort of you know, typical seaside town? Does it ever name where they where they are? No, I can't remember. It never does. No, it's never the name of the place isn't ever mentioned at all. Yeah, because at first I when it said Coney Island, I was like, is this set in like because there is a sort of Coney Island in America, isn't there? And I was like, is this a kind of arcade thing? Then when I heard the accents, I was like, oh no, right, okay. But I just thought it was. Yeah, everything about it was grim. And even as you see, you know, she's trying to go a night out, maybe like, you know, enjoy herself. And even that just, 
as you say, John, it all just seems really kind of seedy and just sort of, you are just kind of waiting on something really untoward happening. It's, it's really grim. I thought the soundtrack was really good as well, particularly in those last final few scenes. Like it felt very, very forceful and very like, again, that kind of made me shudder a wee bit because the music was like super loud. But I thought it was very, very well executed. I thought it was, you know, subtle when it had to be and sort of in your face when it had to be as well. I can't remember the name of the composer, but I just thought that was, it kind of stood out to me as well as being really quite powerful in the film and sort of used really well. Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, it's Adam Janota Bawowski did the music yeah, for it, according I to... <laughs> yeah, well, I'm really like worried. Anyway. Well, I'm convinced I've said that the lead actress's name wrong, is it? Morbid or morbid, is that morbid? Think so, yeah. yeah, I think you're right, yeah. Okay, cool. Just wanted to double check. She is illuminating anyway. I've not. I know she was in David Copperfield, but I haven't seen that. I thought she was. In, she was one of. The, she's one of these faces where you can't tell if she's like twelve or forty, but she was just. I, mean, I think because she did look so young at some points, like she just looked so vulnerable. But I thought she was incredible. Jennifer L is really good as well. I mean, she's just playing a dick basically. But I thought the sort of nuances of Maud's personality, and you know, at times where you could tell she was a wee bit more lucid, and other times where you could tell she was losing control just by the look in her eyes. I thought she was absolutely bloody brilliant and I've never seen her in anything before and I really hope I see her in more stuff because she's incredible. I think you're right. Somebody to watch for the future, definitely. Indeed. Yeah, and it's a shame that it, obviously with the cinemas closing and stuff like that, this film maybe won't get as much time as it would have, but it's something that's been on my radar since, John, I believe you did see it at the film festival. I missed it earlier on in the year, so I really wanted to make a point of going to see it, and I'm really glad that I did. Yeah, it's, it's a real shame that it's, it's not going to get the exposure that it probably desperately needs in order for it to, be, to become a success, because it's actually due out in cinemas this weekend. Yeah, yeah. Ah, right. So, and obviously with the biggest cinema chain as we uh, closing, yes, it's, it's not good. I suspect it will go into a streaming service reasonably quickly, probably the BFI one more than anything, I think. But it's well worth seeking out, definitely is. It's a film that you you should get to see. I don't think it's been marketed particularly well because I saw advertising for it saying it was the horror film of the year, which it's not, and you're kind of thinking, well, it's not that type of film. Mm -hmm. It's not a sort of full-out horror, and I think people will be disappointed if they go in expecting that. It's a wee bit strange that they, they try and advertise these films like that because with smaller films, they rely so much on word of mouth. Yeah. and positive reviews rather than just what it says on the poster for people to yeah. go and see it. And it does them no favours when it's falsely advertised like that. It actually turns people off of going to see it, which is yeah, a shame. Yeah, yeah. I, do hope it, sorry, I do hope it gets a sort of wider audience in the coming weeks, no matter where that kind of finds its platform. Do you guys have anything else to add or do you want to recommend it? What are your kind of closing thoughts on good old St Maud? I think for me, it's like, yeah, I would recommend it. Um, although I'd be quite critical uh, of half the film, I would rather go and see a film that I couldn't get into the first half and it left me with something. Mm -hmm. and I was it all the way through and then just took the pulled the rug out from under me and in the last 10 minutes because you can't invest that much in a film for it to be rubbish at the end. I'd rather. This, this I thought, was fairly dull for the first half. Really kind of picked up towards the end and just as you're getting into it, it's gone in a yeah. good way. And then that, uh, you can think about the rest of it and it leaves you with something, you can digest it. But uh, as you were saying, John, it's definitely not like a the, the quote unquote the horror film of the year. Or another thing I seen in the poster was a horror masterpiece. And it's like, let's not try and put people off this film. Because mm -hmm. we've got that kind of highbrow horror aspect to it that films like Hereditary, maybe even Midsummer and The Witch kind of have. And those could be off putting for people because. It's not nice to be made to feel like you're too stupid to be scared by a movie. Yeah, I, I completely get where you're coming from. However, I also am terrified of The Witch and Black Phillip. Yeah, <laughs> he still occasionally is my sleep paralysis demon. So <laughs> it's maybe hybrid horror is the way to go for me, though, because I don't like blood and guts and crap like that. I'm really not interested in that. And, you know, like slasher, like kind of hostily type movies, that doesn't do it for me as well. I like the slow burn that unsettles me and makes me require more medication for the week afterwards. I'm okay with that. I quite like that. Yeah. John, what are your thoughts? Like, are you, um, would you recommend it? Um, do you have anything else you want to add about your um, overall impression of the movie? I know you've said it's not a horror film. It definitely isn't. I totally agree with you on that. But do you have anything else you want to add? I would recommend it based on the fact that it's not your typical 
horror film. It's a film that is kind of following a trend, like you said, Thomas, with Hereditary and various films like that, that go for the sort of more psychological aspect rather than just full out horror and scares and everything. It can be daunting and it's one of these films that you do really need to watch in order to get something from it. You can't just, there's a difference between viewing and watching a film. As we, as we all know, you can just skim over something and just get the jump scares, for instance, as we've talked about, the sort of the highlights of each film. But there are certain ones that you just do need to keep a close eye on in order to follow it. There's so many small elements that add to the enjoyment of a film like this. Yeah. But it's definitely worth your while. And it's a very short film. It's not going to tax you in any sort of way. I think it's only about 90 minutes long or something yeah. like that. So, yeah, I would, I would definitely recommend it. It's, it's, it's not your... your Typical fare, but it's something you really should seek out, I think, just for a, a change of pace. Yeah, absolutely. I would I would really recommend it as well. I thought it was really unsettling. I thought the central performances were excellent. I loved the cinematography. It was really, really just lush to look at, the bits that I did watch without my hands in front of my face. And I definitely, if, if it comes to, you know, Shudder or BFI play or whatever, please, please seek it out. Um, I think it's quite obvious that now more than ever, films, especially small budget films, need our support. And this is definitely one that's that's worth watching. And as Sammy said, if you like those kind of highbrow sort of maybe less jump scary type horrors, this is definitely the one for you. And obviously a sort of big theme in St. Maud is this kind of idea of you're never quite sure if her religious fervour is, is genuine or if it's, you know, a decline in mental health. So we thought on that note, we would talk about movies that focus on mental health or mental health issues or kind of spectrum disorders for our top three this particular pod and I believe it is the big handsome Catholic John that is up first. <laughs> I don't One introduction. If you thought of, <laughs> about you a Catholic uh, heathen, you're just like, nah, fucking heathen right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing is, you can tell, John F. Kennedy, look at that guy's hair. Our own John has a very similar barnet. We do, we get very good luscious hair. Oh, I've played a game for years and years ever since I've been married that when I'm sitting watching the television and I'll occasionally say, he's a Catholic, <laughs> which is reasonably easy to work out if you, you live in the west of Scotland, let's face it. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game the whole family can play. <laughs> Spot the Catholic in the television. <laughs> For all ages, from one player up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, so. <laughs> no. On that note... Yeah, my first choice is the 1994 film Forrest Gump, directed by Robert Zemeckis and starring Tom Hanks, Robin Wright and Gary Sinise. Now, I'm not going to talk about the main character in this film. The character I want to talk about is Lieutenant Dan, who is one of the side characters that Gump is assigned to his Battalion when he gets shipped off to Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you call those sons of bitches. Lieutenant Dan sure knew his stuff. I felt real lucky he was my lieutenant. He was from a long, great military tradition. Somebody in his family had fought and died in every single American war. I guess you could say he had a lot to live up to. Now, Lieutenant Dan is a, a military man through and through. He comes from a long line of military men, all who died in battle, and you get a short sequence of that in the film. So he's pre-programmed for that to happen. So in the course of the film, there is a rather large raid that happens when they're in the jungle, and rather than letting Lieutenant Dan die, Gump saves him. The only thing is, he didn't want to be saved. He wanted to die, and he ends up in a hospital bed with no legs. And from there, he develops PTSD, and there are all sorts of issues that come to the fore with this character, which were obviously bubbling under the surface. And um, anyway, because of the responsibility he felt in terms of what he had to do and his basically his destiny and the film deals with him coming to terms with that quite nicely and the way that he seeks sort of personal redemption. It's an excellent performance by Gary Sinise as Lieutenant Dan because he does come across as this very gruff, militaristic type to begin with and then comes round to being happy in his own skin. But it takes a, a long, long time for that to happen. And I think it's... It's, it's a very good performance and a very good film, as far as I'm concerned. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I do like Forrest Gump as a movie. I know it seems to be the main thing for a movie that's so popular in that sense. Like, no, it's considered a modern classic. It's only in the last few years I found out a lot of people really, really hate it. Mm -hmm. In terms of the what you were saying there, the, it's a film made of a, loads of little subplots. That's probably the, my favourite bit in it, the Captain Dan. And it's basically the event just took the, the plot of Born on the Fourth of July and managed to add it into this movie as a, a subplot. And it's very cleverly done, so it never really feels forced, never feels sure on then. And yeah, it's just uh, very effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this movie. I, I love Tom Hanks. So, and Gary Sneese, I first saw him in CSI New York <laughs> and then went back and watched Forrest Gump at a later date. And I was like, ah, oh, it's the same person. But he's brilliant in this. He's so... He's so angry. He feels like he's been robbed of his fate in a way. And at the same time, he's coming to terms with the fact that he's not got any legs and he's got PTSD and all this sort of thing. And I just, I love that, that contrast to the sort of naive wonderfulness of, of uh, Tom Hanks. And I just, it's, yeah, it's a brilliant film. It's one of the, the best elements of the, the different storylines that go on. It's a really good choice, John. And not what I thought you were going to say, actually. I thought you were just going to obviously focus on Forrest. So, no. you're surprised that you've come out of left field there with that one. <laughs> I believe I'm next, so I am going to go with a bit of a, it's a basically a children's film, isn't it? So 2015, directed by Pete Doctor, Inside Out. And this is a Pixar movie that centres around 11-year-old Riley, who is moving across America um, because of her dad's job. And basically it goes inside her head, where there are the emotions, joy, sadness, anger, fear and disgust, who are all controlling the motherboard as it were, and taking turns to express how they think situations should be handled. You know, there's the disgust comes into her element for broccoli pizza and all that sort of thing. And it just, I love this movie because, first of all, I like the idea that emotions could be simplified like this. And I love the kind of themes of loss and childhood and grief and memory, which is obviously more complex for a, for a kid's movie. But I kind of, I like this idea that you shouldn't, feel joy all the time joy doesn't need to be in control of your life all the time in fact that's not normal and that it's okay to have all these other emotions particularly sadness sadness is really important as we learn to sort of cope and grow and let go which makes it sound very highfalutin but I, I love this idea of introducing kids to emotions and being comfortable talking about our emotions and how we feel and I think it's so well executed I think the the voice work is incredible it's really really funny at times and also needless to say I had a great quite a few times Times during the film as well because it is quite emotional but I think it's it's really well done when it comes to actually just explaining the basics of sometimes you will feel happy and sometimes you will feel sad and that like both of those things are okay I really really like this I think it's so well done and it's a, a movie that I will go back to periodically just because it's it's fun and it's daft while it's dealing with these quite like high concepts you know psychological things as well and I just yeah it's one of the best sort of modern Pixar's I think and I I really enjoy it I think it's really well done have you guys both seen it yeah yeah did you enjoy it I did I thought it was a very sweet film and I I agree with you that it emphasized the fact that you don't have to be happy all the time yeah. And that's that's a difficult thing to do because you're a difficult thing to get across, especially with children, because mm -hmm. you're always wanting them to be happy and safe and contented. But it's OK if you don't feel that way. And I, I thought it was a particularly clever way of putting that idea across and getting into sort of young minds. It was yeah. really, really good. Very good indeed. Yeah. Thomas? Can't stand it. I hate it. <laughs> okay. I've <laughs> Yeah, listen to this, you can't see the look of the doctor's question when I used to fire at me in one glance. No, I, I absolutely love this film. It's... I actually think my heart's just stopped, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, what the fuck? I actually have a wee sadness downstairs, like, I, I love this movie. I actually just morphed into sadness there. <laughs> <laughs> like, oofed. Fucking no, hell. I love, I love this movie. You just hate life, you hate joy, that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> I went to see the cinema when it came out. And I wouldn't see any Pixar film, basically. I, lo I love the studio. And this movie is absolutely genius, in my opinion, in how it conveys its themes. And it's so authentic. It's so relatable. We all know what it was like being a teenager. Yeah. And especially yourself, maybe when you're being a teenage girl. And how your kind of emotions kind of just will change. But for me, it's because out of the head of the dad. And as an adult, watching the movie, you relate yeah. to that part of it, and I remember seeing it in the cinema, and all the kids are laughing at bits and that. And like most Pixar movies, there's a lot of jokes for adults. Yeah. Here, 
it was a lot more blatant. It wasn't as subtle, and it was just absolute genius how it was done. It's also got one of the most harrowing scenes I've ever watched yep. in a movie. I'm still not over it. That's how I'll say it. Yeah, I remember we went to see it. We were in Florida eh, one year and we went to see it. And obviously, oh, I feel like Sunny World in Glasgow are kind of used to me coming out greeting from films now. So I feel like that's okay to do. But obviously being in a strange cinema, the scene in particular that you're happening, and it was one of those like, <laughs> trying to really keep a lid on it because it was so like oh I wasn't expecting that that's really fucking cut me deep it was yeah really really good, really I've, good. Watched the film, I've watched the film since and I'm watching it going how did I not see this coming <laughs> <laughs> I'm clearly setting that up and it's, it's, it's not it's not a better the second time either but yeah it's yeah. brilliant film so well done Sammy your pick <laughs> I'm going to another end of the spectrum here <laughs> definitely not a kids movie I have went with 2019's Joker, directed by Todd Phillips and Sam Joaquin Phoenix. This tells the story of Arthur Fleck, a uh, would-be failed, would you even call him a failed stand-up comedian? I suppose he has that one scene where he tries it and it goes disastrous. Mm-hmm. Disasters, uh, disasters. I can't say disastrous liberal. <laughs> it's a disaster here. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a stand-up comedian. It doesn't go to plan. He's just not really that funny. Uh, despite the fact that he's actually literally a clown for a living. He's often bullied, he's got some mental health issues, he's abandoned by the state as a funding is cut. Things don't really go well for him and it turns into a bit of a murderer and a would-be prototype supervillain, maybe, depending on if you, how you can interpret the ending of the movie. But I absolutely love this film. Uh, I mean, I've, I've, seen it, I've seen it three times in the cinema and it's just so uncomfortable and unsettling that you're kind of watching it and you're like, Shit, I don't know how I'm supposed to feel during this. Mm-hmm. If you can feel sympathy for them, you feel rage, you feel anger. There are some, some scenes in the film as well that are quite genuinely funny. They're very mm-hmm. few and far between. It's just an absolutely brutal uh, character study. Uh, I think it's an absolute masterpiece of a film. Very, very divisive when it came out. I still do believe and will maintain. I think a lot of that comes to the fact that Todd Phillips directed it and people had an issue liking something he did. And I know of at least two people that, although they said they enjoyed the film, spent a lot of time deconstructing it, like trying to find fault with it, trying to find things Mm -hmm. about it. And I'm like, fair enough, that's how you get your kicks. That's up to you. Not everybody has to like the film, but I just feel that people wanted not to like it. I found a bit straight. Yeah. Uh, regarding the picture of mental health, even that was divisive. I've seen people when it came out saying it was ridiculous, people aren't really like that, blah, blah. And they were basing that on their own experiences, which is fine. I'm not going to judge anybody's uh, mental health issues. But a lot of people did agree with it. A lot of people did find solace of it in many ways. Uh, not necessarily to the point where I said, yeah, I can see where he's coming from. I'm going to go and shoot someone tonight. It was nothing like that. I don't, I think... Arthur Fleck's predicament is sympathetic. I don't think the character really is. He's, he's quite pathetic yeah. in many ways. It doesn't help himself in some ways. He's not really that likable. And if I had, like, was a neural criminologist of that, discussing it, and they thought the film was very accurate of its depiction of a uh, would-be criminal mind, basically, and how people can fall through the cracks, and these loners can really become like violent and really lash out. And I know a lot of people thought well, it was another idea of a stereotypical mental health fish who becomes bad guy. Mm-hmm. Kill him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get I get that criticism, but at the same time, it does happen. Whenever you get a lone shooter in America, sorry, but I get a white lone shooter in America, what's the first mm-hmm. thing to say? Oh, they must have mental health issues. And although that may seem like a cop out at times to say, if, if some people, if people are going to do these acts, there's got to be something not right with their mental well being. Yeah. I think this film is brilliant. I think how it charts his descent, or in this sense, in this sense, basically his ascendance from everyday loser yep. to the would-be clown prince of Gotham is very cleverly done. And the more he kind of drifts into insanity, that's the more he becomes the person it truly should be. And that's a very hard thing to accept as you're watching it. Yeah, I think. Joaquin Phoenix is just 
outstanding in this, like really, really fucking good. I mean, if anyone was ever going to get to the bottom of a character as complex as this, it, it would be him. For me, I thought it was interesting because it portrayed, you know, things like, you know, oh, that service has been shut down or you have to join a waiting list for this. So, and that's that's very realistic of what it's like to try and get mental health treatment anywhere in the world, never mind um, in a privatised system. The whole, the build up to the, that kind of line of, you know, what do you get when you cross, blah, 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 that, that was a bit on the nose and a bit twee for yeah. me. But I'm going to let it slide because the rest of the film was so fucking good. And I get that if you like it, it means you're an angry white incel, but maybe I'm just an angry white incel because I really, really loved this movie. I thought it was one of the best of last year. Yeah, and the thing is, well, I mean, you talk about that line, it is very on the nose. And the context of how it's done and the payoff to it, I think yeah. it really works. And this film, people were concerned it was going to be influential for the wrong reasons. And it was going to mm-hmm. really speak to the incels in a sense that they were going to act out and see the Joker as some sort of like influential and inspirational figure. Mm-hmm. But if you actually look at the movie, it's very liberal in its themes. You know, you, mm-hmm. you mentioned because they're shutting down the mental health service, try to sweep them under the, the carpet, basically. It gets given a gun very easily. I know the yeah. film in the 80s and that as well, but it's basically all these kind of red, all these red flags in the film saying, address these issues. Yeah. All that could happen. And, and there's the line that he writes in this notebook as well, which really fucking resonated actually with me, was the, the funniest thing about having a mental health problem is people expect you to behave like you don't. And that yeah. really, I was like, when that kind of flashed up on the screen, I was like, fuck, that is... First of all, that's so true. And second of all, like this man is crying out at every state, like every person that he interacts with is clearly like there's so many different cries for help and he just gets ignored and ignored and ignored. And it's like, right, okay, how much further does this guy have to fall before something really bad happens? And the payoff obviously is, you know, something really bad does happen. But yeah, as I say, there's that kind of one sentence that I felt was a bit on the nose, but as a kind of overview of how people with mental health issues are not treated, I think is... Yeah, it's fantastic. It's a really great movie. As before we go into Sir John, sorry, I know I'm speaking quite a lot here, but um, the a slight irony I find this film as well that see if those three guys in the subway got murdered in real life, they're probably less outrage. Yeah. From people from certain cell elements of social media, especially the probably Yeah, they probably deserved it. Yeah. <laughs> the film, the kind of case, oh, this, this this film's too violent. It's like, well, it's a violent movie. Violent violence is quite violent. Yeah. It's not, all, <laughs> uh, it's not just a gentle slap with a glove. <laughs> superhero cartoon uh, video game violence yeah there's there's real blood involved usually with violence isn't there it's it's messy and uh it's it's not pretty to look at whereas we are conditioned over the last what 100 years of cinema to see somebody getting shot they clutch your chest and then fall down and there's there's nothing else after that they don't there's no consequences yeah i i love this film and that's not something that you say easily about a film like this it just it was one of these films that worked for me and I, same as yourself i was i was quite surprised at the way it was interpreted by some people especially critics that i have got a, a certain liking for and they dismissed this film out of hand right from the start just because it was almost as if they didn't want to like it and they were just picking holes in the film and uh, I just couldn't understand why that was the case whatsoever. They just weren't given it any sort of time of day, which is pretty poor, to be perfectly honest. And I think a lot of people will change their mind about this film over the coming years. They'll go back to it time and time again and see just, just how a powerful film it is. And unfortunately, it takes time for that to actually happen. Yeah, I can see it becoming a sort of cult classic or whatever you want to call it, it's a bit cheesy, but whatever you want to call it sort of in the future. John, your second pick. Yes. My second pick is the 2012 coming of age drama, The Perks of Being a Wallflower. The mental health aspects of this are all concerning the main character of Charlie, who is played by Logan Lerman. Charlie is a teenager who has had mental health issues since he was a small child. He's been suffering from clinical depression. And when he is starting to get himself back on track, his best friend from high school actually commits suicide, which sends him into a bit of a spiral. So he's coming into high school, secondary school, and he has no friends. And he is befriended by some seniors in school who are played by Emma Watson and Ezra Miller. And 
things start to look up for him because he's now part of a small community and things like that. But his past is still haunting him. There's a lot of stuff that's got to do with his aunt who also suffered from depression and died at a, a young age. And he's going through sort of certain therapies. The, the main sort of plot line for the film is him writing letters to his friend. And obviously his friend is actually himself and he's, he's writing these letters saying how he's coping with certain elements of having to the struggles of going to school, struggles of not having any friends, that kind of thing. And it goes from there. And obviously there's the film spirals in a certain way in that the it because it's following Charlie, it's following his ups and downs as well. Without I don't know if I really should oh, I'm going to give it away. I don't give a damn. There's the the very last scene of the film kind of took my breath away. It, it was just so perfect. It's in the form of a letter that he's writing, and then it goes into a particular song, and it's just beautifully done. I just I just loved it, and for that, it was a good film at the time when I watched it, but that just kind of elevated it just so much more because of that, because it's such a, a hopeful ending without it being sort of mawkish. And it also acknowledged the fact that it wasn't the end. It wasn't needed. You weren't just tying this a ribbon around this whole thing and saying, and now he's cured. It's, <laughs> it had a lot more to do than that. And I know this is a young adult film from a young adult book of the same name, but I just, I was totally taken with it. I loved every single thing about it. Have you seen it? I haven't seen it, no. And no. I've seen the trailers now. I just didn't really fancy it. But your description of it, is not what the film I thought it was. So I'd be, I'd be curious to check it out because it does sound like something I would enjoy. But when mm -hmm. I saw the trailers and that, I was just like, nah, it didn't interest me. At the time. No, it's really good performances in it. Ezra Miller is really good in it. As the, okay. well, he's got, he's, the thing is, all of the characters have their own troubles in it as yeah. well. So there's, there's nobody kind of stable. It's almost like a band of misfits. I take it you have seen it, Mary, by the way. You're grinning away there. <laughs> I just want it noted that it, 1904 on whatever date this is today i have seen a film that somebody hasn't <laughs> i i read the book ages ago and i can't believe it was coming out as a as a film because the book really is told in the letter format and there's sort of you know hints of like you know like dark like abuse and depression and obviously there's you know suicide which sounds really really maudlin but as you say john it does get to the stage where it is kind of uplifting and it's not so much like well that's it the depression's gone now it's just like this is one of these periods throughout his depression where he can actually breathe a little bit. I thought the idea of finding this little community of misfits who sort of came together to sort of support each other throughout their various troubles was really sweet and endearing. But it's never cheesy. It's never cliched. It's just a really good, and actually a really accurate depiction of, do you know what, high school can be really fucking shitty for some people, especially if you've got these sort of issues lurking in the background. And I just, I thought it captured all of that really well. And it's, it's a really good film. I, I loved it. It was one of those films where I probably did cry, but not because I was sad, actually, because I felt really sort of uplifted by it. It's a really good choice. I loved it. My next pick is Barry Levinson's 1988 movie, Rain Man. Of course, I'm an excellent driver. You know how to drive? Yeah. Uh, Rain Man! Rain Man! Rain Man! You never, never touch the steering wheel when I'm driving. Do you hear me? Yeah. Do you hear me? Of course, I don't have my underwear. What? You're using Raymond. You're using me. You use everybody. I'm using Raymond. 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 Am I using you? Am I using you, Raymond? Yeah. Shut up. He is answering a question from a half hour ago. And I'm just going to hit this off by saying I know that this, in a way, did a lot of damage to people with autism because not everybody's this sort of card counting, matchstick counting savant. But I really like this movie because it actually does highlight how how vulnerable but also how clever autistic adults can be as well. Rain Man obviously focuses on the relationship between Charlie Babbitt, who's the sort of, you know, classic sort of cocky car, car salesman played by Tom Cruise, and his brother Raymond, played by Justin Hoffman, who's autistic. Charlie goes to Raymond's care facility to try and basically con him out of their dad's inheritance because Raymond has uh, received it all in a will. And it could be this sort of like cheesy 80s, like, oh, he's the bad guy that needs an attitude change and here's his disabled brother to come and, you know, it, do it doesn't really stray into that territory. I think it's, it's a very difficult film to watch sometimes, especially if you actually know somebody with autism because 
the meltdowns and the lack of social understanding and the lack of ability to sort of run their own life is very, very familiar and very scary. And it does make you wonder what happens to this person when they become an adult or they've got no family to look after them and where are the safety nets there? You know, kind of similar to Joker, what is the safety net for these people and, and how, are, how are they looked after by society? And I like that kind of element of the film as well. And I like Tom, Tom Cruise is, is good in this film. He's just basically playing like him, his cocky self. But Dustin Hoffman is phenomenal allegedly he's based the character on Kim Peake who's quite a famous autistic savant who can actually read two books at the one time literally in, in both hands and he is super clever and super intelligent and I think Hoffman's portrayal of, of an adult on the autistic spectrum disorder is is a wee bit over the top sometimes because it is Hollywood but I actually think it's on the whole very very sympathetic and actually just highlights how much support and love and you know that autistic adults need he's a very very sensitive very vulnerable adult and he's been abused by his brother basically who's just a manipulative dick but I think that the relationship between them as it develops throughout the film you know obviously builds that one kind of scene where um, autistic adults famously don't like you know physical contact but he allows uh, Charlie to just touch his head very softly for a few seconds and it's just it's really well done and yes it kind of is full of tropes and there are a lot of you know sort of disparaging comments to people with autism saying well we're not all like this but I think as far as portrayals go it is very sensitive and Hoffman's performance is excellent it has become one of these kind of classic 80s movies and obviously it's very dear to, to my heart as well and I've saw pretty much every time I watch it but I take it you guys have both seen it it's been around forever yeah yeah. Do you like it? Do you like it as a movie? Or is it too cheesy? No, I like it, but it was a film I actually... Um, I've only seen once, but it was only a few years ago I watched it for the first time. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I was quite late to, to seeing it. So I knew, I, I pretty much knew everything about it until I watched it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I enjoyed it. It's good. Do you want to yeah, it? I really enjoyed it. I remember seeing it at the time and thinking it was a... It's a great movie. It was a bit of a change of direction for Tom Cruise because mm -hmm. prior to that, he'd done Top Gun, The Colour of Money and Cocktail. So mm -hmm. it was a real departure for him in terms of the role. And as you say, he was the bad guy at the mm -hmm. start of the film, which is very unusual for a, a Hollywood star to take on that type of role. I know there's a mm -hmm. certain amount of redemption in it and everything, but it was a bit of a gamble for him at that point in his career. And I think it certainly paid off. Obviously, Dustin Hoffman, got all the accolades and the awards mm -hmm. for his performance, but I thought that Cruz was particularly good in this as well, yeah. Came across very well, and it was a, a very entertaining film. Yes, it was certainly over the top in terms of its portrayal of people on the autistic spectrum, but it's the kind of thing that you get from a, a Hollywood film, unfortunately. It does go all out, but it, it worked as a film for me. I enjoyed it. That's true, and there is a sort of element that, like, my brother is obviously autistic, he has Asperger's and he does have a, a party trick that he gets annoyed if we make him do, but it is maths based. And basically if you say to Matthew, like, what was the 24th of February 1964? He's like, it's a Tuesday. So that's his little party trick. But it's funny how there's this expectation of like performance. I think a lot, that film probably mm. did some damage in the sense that there is this kind of, oh, well, you must be able to count cards because we all we always tell Matthew jokingly we're going to take him to Vegas as well. But there is this kind of element of like, there doesn't have... Autism isn't like a performance. It's not like a circus trick or a party trick or that sort of thing. And I do worry that perhaps those type of portrayals maybe think that people will think that's what all autistic people are like but actually I do think it is quite sensitive in the sense that he has a very vulnerable character and you do really your feelings go straight towards him as opposed to the sort of brash Tom Cruise character but I'm aware that a lot of people think it's done more damage than good but it's just a film that I particularly enjoy watching. Sunny, your pick. I haven't for a film as well that could be argued has done as much damage as it had good or more damaged than good, I should say, but it's still considered a classic of infant. Milos Forman's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Sam Jack Nicholson um, as, a, <laughs> as a character that's not really dated well in terms of why he's been arrested in the first place. He's been arrested for statutory rape, something he's quite unrepentant about and makes jokes about it. And if I know the first five, ten minutes of this movie, there's racism, homophobic remarks, and the statutory rape jokes, and you're kind of like, yeah, it's very much a product of this time, and even now, I wonder what it was going to look like. But he plays the character of Randall McMurphy, who's been arrested, and to try and get out of doing hard labour, he fakes being mentally ill, so he sets an institution. And while he's there, he kind of realises all the 
the patients seem to be like under like the, the thumb and the, the, the fear of Nurse Ratched by uh, played by Louise Fletcher. And he's kind of like, nah, I'm going to kind of shake this place up and kind of become the kind of top dog. Oh, these guys are nuts. I'm not. I can really kind of like make a difference here. And I love this film. I just think it's brilliant. And there has been a lot of criticism to the fact that it doesn't represent mental illness as being authentic. I get that. There is something very stereotypical about the way the whole film is kind of framed. More so the fact that I think this film has also been the, the template for how the stereotypes have came about. But what I really love about this film in terms of the mental illness aspect of it, Randall's the only person that really kind of treats the people like they're real people. Mm-hmm. They're treated like patients by everybody else. They're given a routine. They're almost like prisoners in a sense, which makes this which much a spoiler. But later in the film, you find out most of the patients in there are there by a voluntary. They're not mm-hmm. committed. They can leave whenever they want. But when they're there, they're treated like prisoners. And they're just medicated. There's not really much done for the benefit of the the growth and helping them with their mental issues. And he tries to do that to a degree with differing, with, with contrast and consequences, unfortunately. And this is quite a big spoiler, I suppose, but you get a character, a chief, who, when you first introduced to him, uh, Randall's told, there's no point in speaking to him. He's just, uh, he's dumb and he's deaf. You won't get out, there's no, there's no point, you can't communicate with him. This turns out not to be true. It just turns out people have been ignoring them for that entire time. There's an interest in the fact that they've known this man mountain of a guy. Yeah. It's very visually striking, and because they think he can't speak or hear them, they just ignore him. And Randall makes a real effort to communicate with him, and then later on in the film, he starts speaking to him. And he's like, "Are you sly dog?" <laughs> he's like, "Yeah, <laughs> very much." It's a tragedy of a movie, a very kind of Shakespearean, Shakespearean comedy in the sense that it is very funny for a lot of it. But the ending is oh, it's, it's very, very sad, but also strangely uplifting as well. And yeah, it, it may not be authentic in terms of the mental illnesses it represents. It does try and shine a light on how to treat people and how not to, especially with their mental conditions. And a lot of the extras in the movie were actually real mental patients as well, which I found interesting. I think it's a tricky film because on the one hand, it insinuates that mental health issues can be faked which is still an ongoing issue. Like, even now you're talking about, you know, do you take a mental health day from work or people will just think you're skiving? Yeah. So that narrative still continues. But equally, it does say a lot about, like, the sort of institutionalisation of people who do have mental health issues. As you see, it's this, just this routine and, you know, the drugs are given out and people are ignored and they're not treated as, as humans. It literally is almost like a kind of factory or, like, conveyor belt type mm-hmm. system. So I think it is a kind of a tricky one. But all I'm going to say is it's just making me think of obviously having the watch space recently when Daisy goes to join the, the kitchen <laughs> and there's this sort of nurse ratchet kind of character in that and she's obviously trying to rise up and she gets punished and sent to the dishwashing room. So have you guys watched the series Nurse Ratchet? Is that any good? I haven't watched it yet. I didn't fancy it, but it looks of it. I just didn't see the point of it, but I've heard it's really good, so I might watch it. I've started watching yeah. it. I've only watched one or two episodes and it has nothing to do with the, the oh. film itself. So from what I've seen so far, it's mm-hmm. a completely different setup as well in terms of the the hospital that she's working in. It's, it may lead into something closer to the film at some point, but you're talking, I mean, you're talking about just a sort of post-war years here. This is mm-hmm. sort of the late 40s, early 50s. So it's very much of that period in terms of the way that it's set out. It's good. It's definitely good, but I don't think it's more like an origin story more than anything else for the character rather than leading into the, the film. What did you think of the fact that you could have had Kurt Douglas in this role? Because he had the rights. He played what? he played the main character on the Broadway stage, but he was deep and he bought the rights to the film, but he was really too old to play it by the time that it actually got produced because he sold the rights to it to his son Michael Mm -hmm. and he was the producer for the film and uh, Kirk was too old not to play the role because he was like 60 at that point I think I I didn't know that yeah, it was seventy five. The film was. Uh, I think it's. I think it's one of those films now that it's hard to imagine anybody else in that role. Now I know those been yeah. plays since as well. And I think Christian Slater played it, which I, you can you can imagine that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
this is like peak Jack Nicholson for me mm-hmm. in many ways. He's just starting to kind of really hone in those mannerisms and characteristics he's going to become famous for. Mm-hmm. He's a character that he's an actor that, especially in this role, he managed to be over the top and very subdued at the exact same time, which is incredible. And although the character in this is very, yeah, I think Kurt Douglas is just too, I'm going to use the word manly here, mm. that I think he's too tough. And Jack Nicholson comes across quite a tough guy in this, but he's more kind of Jack the Lad type character. Kurt Douglas comes across too much of a. Yeah, I would say you can buy Jack Nicholas as more of a loose cannon. Yes, that's... when you when you think of you know peak Kirk Douglas, like you think of him as like the kind of almost like the quintessential sort of Hollywood pretty boy. Yeah, he's an action right. star, but he's not rough around the edges the way Jack Nicholson is. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure he's great in the stage play. Yeah, I don't doubt that, but I just I couldn't. Sit. It's hard to see past Jack Nicholson in this particular yeah. it's interesting you mentioned me about the fact that there's actually as a feed i don't know as so much as a fan theory or i can't remember if it's in the book or not it's been that long since so i've read it but maybe it does have a mental condition uh, and a social disorder some kind of condition like that and that's why he's actually been put there he's not mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. but at the same time he's been committed there and other all his most of his friends in there kind of leave when they want Mm-hmm. There's a good line as well when he kind of looks around them and he says, like, you have all been tricked into thinking he's a crazy yeah. to stay here. And it reminds me of the film Unsane. And I won't say too much about it because it could be quite spoilery, but have you seen it? Mm-hmm. No, I missed that at the cinema. I just didn't fancy it. You all know what I'm talking about then, John. Yeah, I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about, yeah. I'll leave it at that. But uh, that, that, that came close to my list, but I couldn't really put it on without going to get too spoiler territory. Maybe I'd recommend it. It's really good. Really, I just maybe the trailers didn't do it justice then because I saw the trailers and I thought oh, that looks a bit guff. But if you guys are both saying it's good, then I, is it on Netflix or anything I can catch it? Or I'm not sure, I'll double check for you. I'll take a wee look, I'll take a wee look. John, your last choice then. My last choice is the 2004 Martin Scorsese picture, The Aviator, starring Leonardo DiCaprio. Obviously, this is a biography of Howard Hughes from the 20s through to, I think it's nearly 1950, just before 1950. And it charts his rise within Hollywood and also charts his battles with mental illness. It starts off quite mildly. He has a phobia or what they they term at the time as a phobia of germs. And that sort of traces back to his childhood and the way his mother warned him against disease and contagions and things like that and obviously on a young and impressionable mind it had certain imprint and he hated germs and he had a certain way about him for the rest of his life but as he grew more stressed in his working life he he famously spent three years making a film for instance then the OCD started to take over and it became very severe. He would lock himself away for months at a time. He wouldn't see people. And the portrayal of this on screen by DiCaprio is something to behold. I watched this film again last night just to remind myself of it, basically because I hadn't seen it for a couple of years. And it's immense the way that he pushes his physicality and he pushes his sort of mental capacities in order to get this across, that this isn't just like the the portrayal of OCD that sometimes like lots of people washing their hands and having to say things three times and all that. It goes much further than that. It goes much deeper than that. It's quite desperate the way he is. And no matter how many people are there trying to help him and guide him, it's his mind that is actually pushing him in a certain way. And it's basically, it's, it's, it's almost as if he's a passenger within his own mind. And it's a really, really powerful story because of that. Much more powerful than if that was put to the side and they just focused on the fact that he had one of the biggest planes ever to take off mm-hmm. and things like that. They didn't, it didn't purely focus on that in the film to its benefit. And I, I enjoyed the film so much more because of that when I watched that again. Have you guys seen this? Semi, Age Before Beauty. <laughs> Have I actually have a same DVD? I've not watched it since. Uh, I can't even remember buying it. I don't know. I don't know if it's kind of one of those films and they just kind of gave me one day. But I got it when I was working in Record Fell. Just kind of picked it up randomly. That's how long ago it was. I, I, I got it. So I don't remember a lot about it, unfortunately. But I, I have seen it. 
Um, I quite enjoyed it. I don't I remember that much, but and I find it interesting as well the fact that you have a Jews and his uh, germophobia, for lack of a better term, has become a kind of comical pop culture reference. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it nearly ruined his life, and it's it's not a laughing matter. But yes, it is treated in that way. Yes, I mean, especially it's the, sensationalized. Yeah, I mean, most famously, I can think of the Simpsons episode when Mr. Mm. Burns at the casino, and then he goes full Hill Juice, so to speak, and but it is really funny. <laughs> it's, it's, it's comically done. Isn't it Captain Sensitive just ahead of World Mental Health Awareness Day? Thing? <laughs> <laughs> But because, um, because it, 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 you look at it from a kind of pop culture point of view, it, and yeah. it, but behind that, there is actually a man who, who was suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and OCD is just seen as a sort of hand washing disease, as opposed to the fact that it literally impacts. You know, some people can't actually leave the house because of it as well. I love this movie. I mean, my God, you've got Gwen Stefani rocking up as Jean Harlow. You've got Jude Law as Errol Flynn. You've got Kate Beckinsale as Eva Gardner, and of course. My modern hero, Kate Blanchett, as my all-time hero, Catherine Hepburn, like that's dreams come true for me. And I, I loved the relationships that developed throughout the film and stuff like that as well. And how you know he was so caught up in a system. And again, it's this kind of conveyor belt thing of like turn your movies out, get this done, get that done. And you know he's so caught up in this system. And actually, he was very clever. He had lots of different interests, but he was so consumed by his own mind and as somebody who's not a fan of DiCaprio I think this is one of his strongest performances I think it's a brilliant film I still find it weird you're not a fan of DiCaprio but listen that's a podcast for another time I know I'm sorry I just I don't know what it is I, I don't know if it's him like as in the person or I just don't really like a lot of his movies I don't I can't actually decide I've discovered actually looking back at a lot of our podcasts that Chris might be right I might actually like Tom Cruise because I like a lot of his films but we're going to keep that secret <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, DiCaprio just yeah, DiCaprio just doesn't do it for me. I'm afraid, and I and that's why I was really getting pissed off with the whole get DiCaprio an Oscar thing. I was like, nah, fuck off! Like, there's loads of people that deserve an Oscar. Why are we all queuing up for him? But this is one of his best movies, and I, obviously, somebody who's quite fascinated by old or classic Hollywood in general. I love when you get to see little nuggets of what it was like behind the scenes because it was so front facing and very studio studio controlled, and you know, you only got to see what they wanted you to see. So I kind of love these kind of further insights. But yeah, that's a, a really good choice. My last pick is actually from classic the classic Hollywood era and it's Frank Capra's 1946 movie It's a Wonderful Life and I know I'm way too early in the year to start talking about this but it's a film that I watch religiously to use a St Maud term every Christmas whether that's at the GFT may please still can it be open by December or on Christmas Eve in the house in my jammies when I'm getting ready for Santa to come. I love this film so much because everyone thinks it's this kind of schmaltzy Christmas feel-good movie and actually I think it's a movie that's quite dark and quite upsetting. It obviously tells the story of George Bailey played by oh, the wonderful Jimmy Stewart and he it takes him takes his story from childhood right up until adulthood and you kind of see that through a series of kind of mishaps and misadventures and just bad luck and wrong timing George isn't really happy in life you know he kind of got the short end of the straw when it came to a lot of things in terms of the job that he does and the fact that he didn't get to travel and, and where he lives he's still in the town that he grew up in and obviously around about Christmas time to sort of go skirt around the plot things happen he ends up pretty much having no money and, and no business and he comes home and he's in a terrible mood and he's got four children and a wife who just want to make him happy and they don't know how to do that and so he leaves and decides that he's going to kill himself because he thinks that the world will be a better place without him and he of course is, is saved by his his guardian angel Clarence played by Henry Travers and he shows him what life would have turned out like for everyone that he knows if he hadn't been there and oh my god it is just you will sob from start to finish like if anyone has ever felt low enough that they think that people will be better off without them and then to actually see what life is like when you're not there to do good and make an impact I think that you know for 1946 I think this is quite brave to be talking about these sort of mental health you know depression suicide these sort of issues yes of course on the surface of it it's a very cheesy smaltzy Christmas film but when you actually look at you know this guy's life experience and again like Joker it's like you kind of see how he's got to this point where he feels like he wants to jump off the bridge because everything has kind of gone to shit and it's just it's an amazing performance by by Jimmy Stewart and there's lots of other good performances from likes of Lionel Barrymore and Donna Reed um, as well but 
it is a feel good movie, but it's also very dark, and I I love it. I think it it does make you kind of sit up and appreciate what you've got and who you've got around you. More importantly, and it's just oh, it's an all time classic, isn't it? It really is on every Christmas. It's just it's brilliant. But watch the black and white version, not the colorized version. Um, I take it you guys have both seen it. It's been around forever, and it is a GFT staple at Christmas time. Do you guys like it as a film, or do you think it's quite cheesy, or do you like the whole kind of darker side to it as well? All of that above. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Yeah, yeah pretty much just, the same. Yeah, yeah but, Jimmy probably, Stewart. Like, how can you not like a Jimmy Stewart movie? Like, oh, and like Jimmy Stewart also was in was also in Harvey, which dealt with mental oh, illness, and it was a toss up between which one I would pick. To be honest, yeah, I love both those movies. I almost picked as well as the fact that I haven't seen it in a while when. I didn't have time to to rewatch like the other films, but yeah, I mean, it's like it's like it's a great it's a great film. It's a wonderful life, and it is just so dark, but at the end, just so life affirming. And it's like if you don't get any joy watching that film, then you're dead inside. Yeah, if you don't want to join in with a slightly out of tune Jimmy Stewart singing "Old Lang Syne" at the end of this movie, your heart is just it's done. It's absolutely done. Yeah, I, maybe That's we should do a Christmas pod. <laughs> We should do a Christmas pod where we talk about Christmas movies because actually, like, as you know, it hailstoned earlier on today and I thought it was real snow. So I got super, it skipped right past Halloween <laughs> movies and was like, right, let's do Christmas. Sammy, your last pick. My last pick, I went for 2012's Silver Linings Playbook by David o. Russell. But you have to have a strategy. I hate my illness and I want to control it. I hope you're okay with Veronica's sister coming over. Tiffany and Tommy? Just Tiffany. What happened to Tommy? He died. How did he die? Please don't bring it up. Hey, Tiffany. This is Pat. You look nice. Thank you. How Tommy die? This is a film that when I first seen kind of advertising that, I thought, uh, yeah, it's probably just some kind of other box standard kind of maybe rom com type idea. I do like Jennifer Lawrence. I like Bradley Cooper. This was from the with Russell as well. Maybe it's something a bit different. And I was in town one day. I had time to kill and just went to see it. I absolutely loved this film. I was just like smiling towards the end of it and you kind of come out of the cinema feeling really kind of like happy and you know if you spring in your step and much the way as wonderful life is not to the same degree obviously that's a totally different like level of film for me and with this it could easily just kind of go through the kind of the bog standard rom-com route and it doesn't it's I don't think it's that, it's faithful to the novel and it's themes in that I do actually find the film better than the novel personally I think that's to do with the casting more than anything, because they're, they're likable characters. But you've got Bradley Cooper by playing Pat, who has been early, discharged early from a mental institution by his mum, so she so he can live back at home. And there's some kind of like, I think it's bipolar that he's been diagnosed mm-hmm. as, and he's very quick to anger, and it can be quite violent. And that comes across really well, because Bradley Cooper plays it very, very intense. He always looks like he's just kind of boiling and bubbling up underneath. And you meet say, Jennifer Lawrence, he's a Tiffany, who again, is suffering from uh, this mental disorder. I think, it's, I think she was a source of bipolar as well, by a psychologist that watched the film after it and diagnosed her. And although these are the two people in the movie with mental illness, they're the two most honest and truthful people in the entire film. And they're also the most interesting in a way because of that. And yeah, it can get them in trouble. But at the same time, there's something very earnest about it. And it really does help the two of them and they grow. And I've seen people criticise this film for the fact that they've said, oh yeah, and by the end of it, well, they'll live happily ever after and their illnesses are just cured. I didn't get that at all. And I think that's a very disingenuous ending to it. You've no idea what happens after the credits. They might just not work out. He might snap. She might snap. You just don't know. But it's quite clear that it were, it's a toxic world they're living in. And by meeting each other, it just makes things a bit better. But one of the best examples of mental illness in the film is De Niro's character, Pat's father, Pat Senior. He's got this underlying OCD that you don't really pick up on until it's mentioned and then it becomes blatantly obvious. And he is suffering from this, from the way he's, uh, he's gambling. And people have to be in a certain area of the room and they be with him watching the game and stuff, that they start of building a certain way before he can put the money on and that. The bit of Bradley Cooper uh, takes one of his envelopes and he's really, really upset about it. It's an envelope. But he's really upset because he's got a system in place. And it's just really, really underplayed. And I think it's just so cleverly done. Even to the point when they're having uh, an argument 
and it has a goat Jennifer Lawrence because it blames her for being a cuss. And then he's actually starts getting angry about the Cooper and he's like, oh, you've done enough. He's done nothing. It's not his fault that the team have won. But he does it just, it's, I think it's one of Rob De Niro's best later in life performances because it's just so under, so sub a subdued performance, especially with the fact that he's also not, it's a supporting character in this. Mm-hmm. He's not the main focus, but it really adds to it and it kind of shows, well, you know what? These are the two people with diagnosed mental illnesses Maybe you should be diagnosed as well, and maybe other people should look inward and have some more self-awareness about themselves as well before they start judging other people. I mean, first of all, as someone who loves a system and things to be in the right place, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just how things are supposed to be. I'm actually going to admit something. I only got about 45 minutes into this film and gave up. I just, it wasn't doing anything for me. But now that you're talking it up again, I'm like, should I just go back and watch it? I'm sure we've got the DVD downstairs, but I maybe just wasn't in the right frame of mind. But... It wasn't really, I, mean, I, just couldn't, I couldn't get into it. Speaking of games, I mean, I've seen this film a few times now, and it's never been as good as when I first watched it, and I just passed my feed test when I went to see it, so I'm <laughs> glad I it. But I still enjoy it, and I still I still think it's a, a very respectful film of, mm-hmm. of the, the conditions. Now, again, whether you can argue that any of these films are spoken about are authentic in terms of that's how people really are. They're definitely respectful, in my opinion, of people with these conditions. Yeah. I was, about like you, Sammy, I was surprised. I thought it was going to be a certain type of film that dealt with mental illness and it was something completely different. It really kind of took me by surprise and I, I think I enjoyed it more because of that, because of the surprise factor and the intensity of the sort of main performances. That really sort of shook me because I wasn't expecting it. I was expecting a, a Hollywood style Oh, I, I don't want to like uh, this on Rain Man or anything, but that's the kind mm-hmm. of yeah, no, attitude I get what you mean. that they yeah. have. It wasn't a, a Hollywood depiction of mental illness here at all. It, it was something that felt as if it was it was quite real, and it was obviously very well researched. Obviously, it came from the book itself, so yeah. it came across very well in that respect. But it, it was a very intense film, and I can understand why you would only last like three quarters of an hour watching it, Mary. I, I can see that. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, and I'm not, like, I'm the first one, you know, mental illness isn't glamorous. It's not like you're away, like, buying your heat off the windows and the next minute you're, like, tripping the light fantastic down the street. Most of it is just you feel about shit all the time, and that's not really cinema worthy. It's not very cinematic, which is why, like, for example, in the case of Rain Man, it does, you know, these sort of tropes or whatever are very much capitalised on because it, it gives it that that storyline and that's not the issue that I had with this it wasn't that I felt it was kind of deflated I felt the performances were quite authentic and seemed quite genuine I just I don't know why it felt so slow to me but now I mean you guys are both really raving about this I might go back and and, and watch it again actually because it does feel sound like something that like on paper I should probably like this so I, 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 I get annoyed when I don't like films that I think should tick all the boxes as it were um, so I might go back and watch it so we call peer pressure yeah. 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 So, yeah. But No, I'm a vulnerable adult, John, and you guys just see things and I'm like, yeah, let's go along with it. Unless you're asking to watch like <laughs> fucking 17 parts of a horror series, in which case y'all are on your own. That's um, why we're only pitching six episodes of a horror series. <laughs> yeah. I- so thank you very much for joining us on the latest Movie Scramble podcast. We'd love to hear your ideas about the films we've discussed. Do you think they portray mental health accurately or do you have other films that you think do a better job? If you want to get in touch with us, the email address is podcasts at moviescramble.co.uk. The pressure to get that right. Or you can talk to us on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram or you can slide into Sammy's DMs anytime you feel like it. See you guys soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.